Well, thank you for uh, the lovely introduction. I've got a little bit of feedback on the mic. I'm going to try and bring it down a little bit, but if you can't hear me, let me know. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I have had a bit of a whiplash day. So I started this morning in uh, DC where my family and I now live working at the White House, uh, got on the train, came and had this incredible conference on spirituality, which was in my personal capacity. So I got to put on my uh, democracy prep hat. I got to sort of be back in my old, uh, my old universe here in Harlem where I, I, we actually live when I'm not uh, in DC. Uh, and then after my talk, which is about the same pace that you're going to hear, uh, which is a fast pace and pretty dense, we went straight into a meditation session. Uh, and that was then uh, brought out by our conversation on sort of the next phase for research and technology, and now our conversation on STEM education. So it has been a wide-ranging day, uh, and I'm honored to be with you guys together. Um, it is not October 6th, I realize, but I did not remember to change the first slide. Uh, but what I wanted to tell you about the work that we're doing right now with the president is it's some of the most inspiring and exciting work that I've seen uh, in my professional life, building schools, doing policy work at the federal, state, and, and uh, local level, uh, and now working for the president. It's really a, a remarkable honor because this is a president who gets it. So um, before I actually go much further, I'm going to give you, I'm going to bring his voice into the room because I think that sometimes uh, he says it better in his uh, uniquely presidential way that, uh, than pretty much anyone else can. So let's see if this works here. My parents invested in me, my grandparents invested in me, but my country invested in me. And I want America to now invest in you. <clears throat> we know that the nation that goes all in on innovation today will own the global economy tomorrow. Teachers and principals in schools from Tennessee to Washington, D.C. are making big strides in preparing students with the skills for the new economy. Problem solving, critical thinking, science, technology, engineering, math. So I want you to know why it matters that we make sure technology is available to every child. Be able to take AP biology or AP physics even if her school is too small to offer it because she's got the access to technology that allows her to take those classes online. Imagine what it means for a, a boy with an illness that combines him sometimes to home, where he can join his classmates for every lesson with FaceTime or Skype. In, in an age when the world's information is just a click away, it demands that we bring our schools and libraries into the 21st century. If America pulls together now, if we do our part to make sure every young person can go as far as the passion and the hard work will take, whether it's to Mars or to the bottom of the ocean or to anywhere on this planet where you've got an internet connection, if we commit ourselves to restoring an opportunity for everybody, then we can keep the American dream alive for generations to come. The future belongs to young people with an education, and the imagination to create. That is the source of power in this session. You get to decide what comes next. You get to choose where change will take us. Just imagine what you can create in the years to come. So I say not lightly um, that you know it's it's hard to follow the president, but on video it's a little bit easier. Uh, he is someone who gets this deeply. He is a person who, on the Oval Office wall, has um, patents and innovations from American innovators. He is deeply committed to STEM and talks about it. He sort of works with both my boss Megan Smith and the science uh, advisor of the United States, Dr. John Holdren. And when he's had a day full of meetings about ISIS and Syria and all the challenges, we continually here and see that he gets excited to talk about STEM and innovation. So uh, it's an honor to work for a president who gets it. Uh, but what is so amazing about the transformation that's happened in the last seven years is how far we've come as a country in this area specifically. So I'm excited to, to work with you through a couple of those things that we've done so far. Um, the first thing is that you had to start the process. So on his first day in office, quite literally, the president created a new job. 
This is a job that had never existed before in the federal government. He created the chief, te chief technology officer of the United States of America. Up until now, we have this multi-trillion dollar operation moving along without a CTO, right? Most small companies have a CTO, and here was a country that didn't have a CTO. And so he brought in uh, uh, now three CTOs. Uh, and in the middle of the, the tenure, you may remember that there was a challenge with healthcare uh, and healthcare.gov specifically. So after passing the ACA and making great progress, the website um, had the potential to basically jeopardize the president's legacy um, simply because of a website failure. And so he brought Todd Park, the chief technology officer at the time in, and a team from, uh, from the private sector to come and help fix that problem. And what happened is that the president, but not only the president, because honestly he got it because his election in 2008 was based largely on the success of their technology platform. But he was able to convince the other people in DC, the, the policy wonks and the people in the building and the, the folks who are not necessarily the technolo technology focused folks in the building, that this was a transformative opportunity to think about government differently. So what my boss often says is that we now needed to do number one, which is to welcome TQ into government. What we mean by TQ is that we're all excited and certainly people at the White House have a tremendous amount of IQ, right? We're smart people. Everybody here at TC is smart people. Then we talked about EQ. That became sort of the buzzword for many years, this thing about the emotional intelligence that we have. But the thing that was often left out of those conversations uh, in policy discussions was TQ, technology capacity, technological intelligence. And so we started bringing people in. And so we've started to, to play this methodology, what we call a 3.0 methodology, I'll share with you a little bit today, which is instead of trying to conjure new ideas in government, instead of trying to build something like healthcare.gov through government, we instead need to use this model, which is to understand and explore the problem, problem definition, like the, the design thinking would, would ask us to do. Then we need to scout for the people or the organizations who are already solving that problem. Then interconnect them to collaborate and scale those promising solutions, iterate the new models, and finally change the internal and external culture that is what caused government and healthcare.gov to have the challenges that it had in the first place. So simultaneous to all of that, we need to be advancing the STEM policy agenda. This is a big, tall order to both transform the way government works and the content of what we do as a government. And so what the president did was he brought in Megan, my boss. Uh, she's a former head of Google X. She is somebody who is a, a, a true genius. The way that she thinks and looks at the world is different. She's a moonshot thinker, top to bottom. And so she is taking the problems that government is facing and trying to approach it with totally new um, uh, methodology. And they basically built the, the capacity by bringing in what's now 300 technologists. So in our tiny office in the, in the White House, we have the former general counsel of Twitter. We have a professor of computer science from Princeton who's one of the deputy CTOs. We have somebody who led the healthcare.gov rescue. We have somebody who's like the number four at LinkedIn, uh, the chief data scientist in the United States. The people that actually have been in the technological world are now serving a tour of duty in government so that they can bring those skills and that knowledge to government which has been missing it for so long. And along with them, they've brought 300 other practitioners, people from Amazon and Facebook and you name it, they've come now to serve government in the way that you might think of uh, the Peace Corps or you might think of the White House Fellows Program or other opportunities for short-term public service. The president has now called on people with technological skills to come in and provide these tools. And so I just wanna to say to this room, which I'm sure has some of those people, uh, the president and the, the United States government is looking for you. We wanna find ways to tap into those technological skills and actually use them in a way that you get, can't get any better leverage than this, serving all 300 plus million people in America through the work that we're doing in government. So there are different on-ramps. The Presidential Innovation Fellows is, is more of like entrepreneurs and residents in federal government. The 18F team are builders. They ship product and they ship product with open source code so that that rest of government can use that product. And then the U.S. Digital Service is a team that helps to fix problems and, and find uh, the challenges that might happen right now, for example, in the VA or other parts of government that are having paper backlogs coming in with a very different methodology to change those things. And they've now created a series of best practices in government. So one example is what the digital service put together is a playbook. This is not rocket science, what you're seeing here. These are the digital service plays that used to be a totally foreign concept to government and are now part of our standard procedure, our standard operating procedure, because we're changing the way that government operates. It is a paradigm shift in how government operates to move to first understanding what people need. That sounds crazy, but the first step was very often missed by government. Government often thought, we know what you need, or would identify it as a problem at the macro level, but not actually understand at the micro level what's really going on. Addressing the whole experience from start to finish, measuring outcomes from start to finish, 
making it simple and intuitive, building the service using agile and iterative processes, structuring budgets and contracts to support delivery of a product, assigning one leader and holding that person accountable, bringing in experienced teams from other sectors, choosing a modern technology stack, deploying a flexible hosting environment, automating testing and deployments, managing security privacy through uh, reusable processes, data to drive decisions, and de default to open whenever possible. So like that is an absolutely typical playbook from any startup in Silicon Valley. But now we're taking that same playbook and we're applying it to federal government in ways that have never been applied before and seeing remarkable results. And this is a paradigm shift that I am both excited to watch unfold um, and inspired by because I had my own paradigm shift. And I want to now take you on a little bit of a, a meandering road to understand how I ended up standing in front of you at TC and working at the White House, because that paradigm shift for me really starts in thinking about STEM education. And it starts back in 2001. At the time, my girlfriend was on a, uh, a Fulbright scholarship teaching in South Korea. She was an ETA and she was um, amazing uh, and said, come out and visit me. And so I went out to visit her for two weeks and she convinced me that I should stay. Um, I had no teaching certificate. I had no de desire or plan to stay. But when your girlfriend says stay in Korea and get a job, you decide that that's the right decision. Uh, and so uh, young Seth says, OK, this is a great idea. I'm going to stay in. I don't have a teaching certificate. I've never really taught uh, my own full classroom before, uh, but I'm going to make this happen. I got hired at a low income public Korean school, uh, which taught me so much that I had no clue before walking into that paradigm shift what I was getting into. This is also a Korea that even the 15 years that have, have passed is a very different Korea than the one that we think about today. But what I started to understand as I got into the Korean education system is what's happened over those 15 years and beyond. The first is that America used to be leading the world in international assessments in math and reading and science on the other PISA exams and TIMS exams, uh, and now we're not. We're falling further and further behind while Korea has been rising further and further ahead. Furthermore, we stop to sometimes think, well, maybe that's just that we're not distributing, you know, we're a more diverse country, we have got this distribution, um, so maybe there are parts of America that are doing better than others. Well, the highest performing state in America pretty consistently over the past decade is Massachusetts and all the, uh, all the tests that we can compare apples to apples like NAEP. And in fact, Massachusetts is still behind their, I know it's a little bit there, right? Still behind Korea. So the entire nation of Korea, including the low performers, the entire bell curve is performing more, uh, is performing better than our highest performing state. So America is in a position right now of a real transition and we have to figure out how this happened. And so I want us to start with going back to figure out, identifying what were those challenges? What were those opportunities and what made it possible? In 1951, for those of you who don't know, your, who didn't walk in tonight uh, expecting to hear Korean history, uh, the uh, Korean War ended, uh, it's technically still going, but a sort of arbitrary line was drill, drill, uh, drawn between North and South. In the North, there was no democracy, no market economy. In the South, there was a democracy and a market economy. And that experiment, the equivalent of a random control trial, has been going on for the past 60 years. And that random control trial has led to absolutely remarkable results because, in fact, the critique that I hear in just a, is very often about, well, it must be about the people. But here you have North Korea and South Korea on the same peninsula with the same lack of natural resources, with the same history, with the same language, and yet we see this massive difference between the two. So what was it that made it possible from South Korea, which was as poor as Afghanistan and Uganda and India in 1951, to now one of the wealthiest and healthiest countries in the world? And what, part, what role did STEM education play in that transition? Well, my experience in Korea, teaching Korea, brought me four lessons. These four lessons are ones that I then brought back to my schools when I founded schools in, in uh, New York. And I'm, because I'm in my official capacity, we won't go into those as, as much in depth. But the lessons that we learned in, in South Korea can be applied, I argue, to every school. This is, again, not rocket science. However, it is the opportunity for us to take these lessons and put them into practice in the same way that Korea did uh, for the past six decades. One is simple, hard work equals success. It's a linear function. The harder we work, the more successful we'll be. That is a sentiment that we have to convince our students in STEM and in every other field is deeply ingrained in what we expect of them. The second is that we have, in, in, Korea, in the Korean education, respect for great teachers. In fact, in the Korean language, there's a word for teacher which is sunsingnim. Sunsingnim means honored one. In America, we are still just Mr. and Mrs. We're still just Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so. I'm Mr. Andrew if I'm a classroom teacher. 
We give lots of titles in a way in America. We give away professors, we give away doctor, lawyer, we give away uh, clergy members, military officers, lots of titles. They don't cost us anything as a society. But we choose not to honor and value and respect educators at the highest level in the way they do Korea in their very language. So these are cultural shifts that have to happen. The third is the idea that education is the highest value. And what I mean by that is that I work primarily with low-income kids, kids who are actually on an absolute basis poorer than my kids in Harlem. And yet, if I handed them $1,000 and said, here, spend it on anything you want, these poor families would be consistently spending it on educational opportunity. And that is not the same culture that our kids are growing up with in Harlem, in other low-income communities. And so the culture was something that basically built to value education at the highest level in a way that made every dollar, every minute, every ounce of energy that family had invest in education because they believed that that had the highest return. And finally, I don't want to, to glorify Korea without sort of mentioning that it has tremendous weaknesses. It is a system that probably went too far in some of these areas. It is a system that, that got, that went, uh, that the pendulum swung a little bit too far. And so one of the things that I learned from this experience was when you have the opportunity to combine the best of East and West, when you have the opportunity to combine the best from different cultures, it yields a better result. And this is a great news for America because we are one of the most diverse countries on earth. We have this incredible well of opportunity in our diversity if we harness it and use it for that strength as opposed to seeing it as a weakness or a liability. And so what the, the president and the White House have tried to do is really to capture some of those lessons and put them into practice uh, in the Korean educational experience, but more broadly. Now this comes in large part from the 1965 Ed Elementary and Secondary Education Act. The hypotheses in the original, what became No Child Left Behind, what became the sort of most recent uh, efforts to reauthorize ESEA, had five basic hypotheses. We need to reduce high pro uh, poverty, we need to have more teacher credentials, we need to have smaller classes, spend more money, and the idea that culture is fixed and that's not something that can change. That was the hypothesis we used for 50 years. The updated hypotheses that we're talking about today are increasing the rigor in our expectations, finding inspiring talent, not just about certifications or credentials, using thoughtful data to target what each kid needs through personalization rather than just reducing class sizes by themselves. Spending more time instead of just more money. America spends the second highest really in the world, the most developed countries, per pupil. This is not a dollar question in the aggregate. It's about how we spend those dollars. And then the, the last one, which to me is the most important, is the idea that culture is malleable. So if you are sitting there thinking, well, Korea has a different culture, I just leave you with two big thoughts. The first is North and South Korea had the same culture prior to the war. Now they have totally different cultures. America can evolve. Culture is malleable. It is created by humans, and it is our opportunity to turn that culture into what we want it to be. And so for me, that is the greatest piece of news that we have, is that we can make the culture what we want. So if we want to implement these things, these higher rigor, these better talent, the respect for teachers, better use of data, then we can do that because the culture is ours and we create it, especially as teachers, especially as school leaders. We get to put people into a school building for hundreds of days a year, for hours and hours a day, and build the culture that we choose. And so it's up to us to build the culture that we want. So let me walk through a couple of those differences. We need to really move away from these ideas of credentialing and certification and bonuses to things like authentic diversity, competent and humble teachers, and performance steps based on outcomes, not based on inputs. We need to move away from things like just thinking about founding new things, but actually transitioning and sustaining them. So for example, in the charter school sector where I worked and where the Obama administration has invested uh, more than a billion dollars to grow and build a public charter school sector, um, there was a lot of work on building new schools. But now a lot of those people, myself included, have transitioned. We've moved on to the next chapter. And so we have to think about how to sustain those gains that were made in some of those laboratories and those, those early uh, leaders and make sure that they sustain, they're sustained over time. In the early days of this work, we often talked about high school completion as the, as the goal. Well, in fact, high school completion is up. We have more than 80% of Americans now getting a high school diploma, which in the past eight years, so for prior to 2008, that was a flat number. And now in the past eight years, it has moved tremendously, leading to millions of new graduates over the past uh, just eight, seven years. And so we're seeing the, the achievement dividends start to come in. In fact, tomorrow at the White House, uh, you can go on to whitehouse.gov slash live and watch the uh, forum that we're hosting on next generation high schools. And the next generation high school, we're going to have a couple of announcements, including this achievement dividend and what this increase in high school graduation rates has meant for the country. However, we also know that a high school diploma is not what it used to be. 
and that we have to move to college completion and actually to be prepared for the success of the and the challenges of the world around us. We have to move from agricultural time to technological time. We have to rethink the way that school operates and functions in every single facet. When we think about increased rigor, we used to think about it as proficiency. What percent of your kids are proficient on the test? Right? And that was a model that was based on a very static measurement tool. The old assessments were static. They, didn't, they weren't dynamic, they weren't adaptive in any way, and they weren't personalized in any way, and now we have such better tools than we did just five years ago. Park and Smarter Balance, the two consortia that most states have now adopted, are dramatically better assessments than they were. Now, the president recently called for reducing the total time on unnecessary tests and stopping the, the use of, um, of redundant tests, which we've all supported for a long time. Actually, it hasn't been a federal expectation. It's been a state and local implementation. Uh, but that said, we recognize our role in saying that we need to, to send a clear message that the goal is not assessment for its own sake. It's so that we can tailor instruction to individual kids through dynamic, adaptive, personalized assessment and instruction that comes from it. In uh, using that data that we get, we need to move away from things like averages. Averages tell stories that often aren't the real story. They hide things like outliers, they hide things like bell curves and, and uh, uh, different performance. And so we really need to think about mastery as the tool that we measure for kids. To say, if we have a standard that we want you to reach, we can't say, what is your average on the test? We need to say, did you master these standards in this sequence that we think is going to best prepare you for your future success? In schools I still walk into, the principal often wants me to take me to their data wall. And it's a bunch of pieces of ta paper taped to the wall. right? And we need to move away from data walls to things like machine learning and actual analytics in thoughtful ways that are real time, moving away from spreadsheets to visualize data, moving from analog to digital in pretty much every way. And for me, the most important, as I said, is culture. So to create a joyous culture in school where kids are excited to go every day. We have to change not just structures, but the mindsets, the mindsets of the adults, the mindsets of the parents, the mindsets of the students themselves to hold that higher bar. We need to move from punitive systems of both discipline and st academic structure to purposeful structures. The president hosted a, a convening on rethinking school discipline because we know that there are massive disparate impacts in the way that school discipline is, is meted out across the country. Uh, we need to move from startup to turnaround and figure out how to take the lessons we've learned at high performing schools and apply them to failures. Um, we're, tomorrow we're going to hear from Bob Balfans, who's at Johns Hopkins, who has identified the 590 schools in America represented, that, that are responsible for 50% of America's graduates. So we're not really talking about, in some way, this national problem. We're talking about failure factories and dropout factories in just basically 600 schools that if we solved the problem there, we would have solved more than half of America's dropout crisis. So we need to move from remedial to accelerated and really think differently about the work that we've done. So what I presented to you so far is a little bit of the approach from what it was when we walked in the door to what it needs to be walking out of the door in about 61 weeks. And so we believe pretty deeply in data, both as an administration and as, a, as a, my boss who sort of ran um, uh, technology companies. So we look to researchers at TC, um, who's gotten some great uh, funding through the federal uh, programs, including I3 and others, to support their research work. We were just talking about other opportunities to expand some of those research opportunities, uh, the National Science Foundation, the IES, and others that provide research dollars for institutions like TC to capture this. Um, one of the researchers that did some of this work for, for um, this space was Roland Fryer, who is an amazing a professor of economics at Harvard. And he basically analyzed the pillars that I just described to you as a hypothesis. And in the early phases of the work that we did to identify promising models through lab schools, identified those five pillars. Inspiring talent, more time, increased rigor, thoughtful data, and joyous culture. And so by putting those five things together, he wanted to look through not in a hypothetical or theoretical frame, but in a quantitative frame. And he wanted to compare it to the things that we had been spending money on up until now, the things in the early 1965 ESEA approach that I talked to you about before. Well, unfortunately, this is what he found. The school inputs and practices that we had been using for 60 years were leading to negative results in a, quality, in a quantitative study by one of the best economists and a MacArthur Genius Grant winner in our country. While some of the things that we were doing that had some of the best results in just a few schools didn't even cost additional dollars. Things like higher expectations, which had more than uh, three weeks of additional learning. This, this uh, y-axis is additional months of learning based on implementing a regime of higher expectations. So higher expectations cost nothing. My favorite quick story about this is that when I was a principal um, uh, 10 blocks from here, I would go to the high school and I'd talk to the high school kids and I'd say, how are you doing in classes? And they'd say, great, Mr. Andrew, I'm passing all my classes. 
I'd say, well, that's not the goal. What made you say, why do you tell me you're passing all your class? And I would hear this over and over from kids in the hallway. And it became clear to me that they were saying this because that's the bar we set. When we said it takes a 70 to pass a class, kids were saying, great, I got a 71. So in the middle of a school year, which means that we didn't change the teachers, we didn't change the curriculum, and we didn't change the kids. In the middle of a school year between trimester one and trimester two, we got the faculty together, we had a parent meeting, and we said, uh, much to our kids' disappointment, we are raising the passing grade to an 83. Now that was not the, the day I was the most popular at the high school, but it was the day that kids realized that the bar was raised. And what happened was miraculous in that the GPA in trimester two and trimester three went up tremendously. The curriculum didn't change, the kids didn't change, the teachers didn't change, the methodology didn't change, the building didn't change, the money didn't change, the poverty didn't change. No other factors changed except for our expectations. And as a result, we saw quantitative outcomes where our kids were working harder and striving harder because we raised the bar. And so Roland's research and some of the other research from similar researchers has found that we can actually raise the bar by doing these five things in more uh, methodical uh, uh, format. We can provide much greater teacher feedback. So at places like the school that I, uh, I founded and the network that I built, um, we make sure that every single teacher has somebody observe them and give feedback every single day. It might be a peer, it might be a colleague, it might be a mentee, it might be a mentor, it might be the administrator, every day. And that is something that is possible because we're a small enough community where you can get that uh, 400 kid school, the principal can come into your room and see uh, what's going on and give you feedback. And it might be just a short email, it might be a one or two line note about what they saw, what was working. But the big picture is that teacher feedback has a quantitative uh, impact on student outcomes. Second is data-driven instruction, which we've talked about, tutoring in small groups. One of the things we did in our schedule was we built a, a block in the day where kids got tutoring. Some kids got acceleration, some kids got tutoring, some kids had different opportunities, but the big picture was that almost every single day there was time for kids to work in small groups with one another, with peers, with teachers on the issues that were personalized for them. And we started this even before we had good technology that now supports us in creating those groups and identifying the personalization structure. Roland also found uh, that instructional time had a positive impact. So 0.8 of a month of instructional time so that places like Korea and other nations that have dramatically more time on instruction, if you're doing good things in the classroom, then obviously your more time is gonna lead to great results. So the president took these, uh, and the, the secretary, so I used to work with Secretary Duncan, um, took these lessons and built Race to the Top. Race to the Top has uh, you know, evolved in its brand quality over time, uh, which just means that there is a lot of, of reflection that happens. But I will tell you that in retrospect, Race to the Top is going to be one of those things that we can look back on and say that changed the paradigm of the way that the federal government thinks about education. Because what it did was said, states who wanted additional resources, they were optional, they were voluntary, but states who wanted additional resources could apply to do them by doing these pillars that were based in the research. Better assessments and rigorous standards, longitudinal data systems and growth metrics, professional development for educators, and turning around the lowest performing schools. And so Race to the Top helped to develop that. And from that, the personal hypothesis that I just described of, of transitioning from an old model to a new model started to emerge. Now here's where my personal change happened. I built this amazing network of schools that I'm proud of, that I walk into every day and, and just uh, am inspired and honored by the teachers who do their work, by the principals who do their work in those schools. But we have 5,000 kids in a city with 1 million kids. And so it became clear that we had a linear solution to an exponential problem. And that culture was going to be the tool that was going to have to change, but there was something new that we had and that Korea had really pioneered, had taken ahead of almost everybody else, and that was technology. And so the beauty is that if culture is gonna change everything, the question of is how fast can we get that culture and that technology to change the student experience in what we thought of as the classroom. And if we can change the student experience in the classroom, if we can change what is actually happening for real kids in real classrooms, that is where we're gonna see the power. So technology is this revolutionary tool, but it might change it for the worse if we don't get it right, right? We might just, as we were talking about before, digitize the same bad practices we've been using forever. It might just make us more efficient at delivering low quality education. So we have to make sure that this tool is actually not just a tool to do the same thing faster or with you know, more data or fewer teachers. It's a tool that must be able to give kids the ability to create, not just consume, the technological culture that's ahead. So that means we need to think about computer science, we need to think about STEM in totally new ways and different ways than we have before. 
Now for me, the, the end of the story is that um, I had this opportunity to sort of graduate with our kids who now 90% of our alum are off in college succeeding uh, in, a, in uh, the college of their choice and a life of active citizenship. But then we, once we built the technological culture that I described at the beginning, we had to set the agenda for the administration. So now I'm gonna walk you through a few of the priorities of the president in both our remaining time and that we've accomplished thus far. The first is the need for more STEM grads with 21st century skills, and that means STEM for all. It can't be something that some kids have. We all hear this, you know, I'm not good at math. That can't be a sentiment we have in America. It's not a sentiment that they would allow in a middle school in Korea, in, my, in the school that I taught in. We have to recognize that every kid needs STEM, that it's not a, cert, a track for some, it's not a special focus, it's gotta be every kid gets some opportunity for STEM. We launched the Connect Ed initiative, which is, um, includes both billions of dollars in E-rate funding to wire low-income schools and private commitments to, to incorporate those, um, those private uh, resources into those low-income schools to make sure that our, our broadband connectivity is truly equal access in schools. We're not there yet at home, but we're definitely on the right path. We need to change how we teach to active learning and not just passive learning. Nobody learns uh, to play baseball from a lecture, right? You learn by doing it, you learn by practicing it. And that doesn't mean you don't have to have content. You need to know the rules of baseball, but then you need to be able to have the hands-on experience of playing if you want to be a great baseball player. So we need to change the what we teach, the how we teach, and we need to be aware of the incredible and pervasive media and bias challenges that we're facing. So we have to change the image of STEM. We have to reduce bias, and that includes unconscious and conscious bias. And we have to increase inclusiveness so that everybody feels part of this movement and not just some. It's part of why the president is such a great messenger for this work. So we set about this priority agenda. We started by doing things like fixing the things that were broken, the low-hanging fruit. So FAFSA has gone through a total transition, and most of the people in this room probably did this in the old system where it was really brutal. And now we've gone to something called prior prior, which means you don't have to actually have your parents' tax returns for that year in January when you're submitting your FAFSA. We've simplified it to make it a much easier system. The First Lady has gotten behind this initiative, really pushing hard for something she calls reach higher, making sure that kids' expectations are raised in every single uh, opportunity they can. We've moved to wire all schools through Connect Ed. Um, I love the president's quote. He said, in a country where we expect free Wi-Fi with our coffee, we should definitely demand it in our schools. And we realized that most uh, Starbucks had uh, equal to or better bandwidth than average schools when we took office. And so there's been a tremendous responsibility to wire schools so that you can actually get the devices online even if you have the hardware and you have the software and you have the trained teacher. If your Wi-Fi won't have everybody online, then you're not actually going to accomplish the, the personalized goal that you want to, to achieve. We're on the right track, but we've got a ways to go. My role at the Department of Education uh, was to really figure out how to engage district leaders because leadership in this is such an important and essential piece of this. If you don't have leadership from the top, a lot of things that I'm talking about at this classroom level aren't gonna be supported. And so sure, you can do your thing in your classroom and put up construction paper on your window and hope nobody bothers you. But the real goal is to make this pervasive across the culture. So you need the leaders to step up and really take that leadership role. So we got more than 2,000 leaders to make a pledge to Future Ready Schools. And so you can go to futurereadyschools.org and see that pledge that we wrote to get uh, district superintendents of traditional public schools, not just uh, public charter schools and others, but traditional public schools to say, we want to go to the next phase. We want to become Future Ready. And we got the president to come meet with the superintendents and talk about some of those challenges. And then we followed up by not just having those amazing soups at the, the White House, but we actually did regional summits around the country, bringing in superintendents, more than 500 superintendents in person with their leadership team to build a plan to actually implement STEM for all, to implement some of these hypotheticals that I'm talking about and actually see what, what is happening. And then on the image and bias front, we need to make sure that everything we do is changing that. So I'm going to share one more quick video with you, uh, which is one of the ways that we tried to combat uh, the image and bias challenges, uh, which is by the president's choices, and the president um, has the bully pulpit, and that is we can't pass a ton of uh, legislation through Congress right now, um, but we can show people what we think that STEM can look like, and who we choose to do that, who he chooses as the CTO, who he chooses as the participants in his events, are a big way of sending that message. So here's the president, uh, the first president in the history of the United States of America to write a line of code. <laughs> Uh, but all across the country, people are doing both. 
So we have this opportunity now in our classrooms, in our schools, and for those of you that are, are TC or TC alum uh, in the work that you do, to take uh, that challenge of, uh, of bias and representation and make sure that you are doing your part to give every single student the opportunity to see themselves in computer science, to see themselves in STEM, so that the gaps that we see in gender and in uh, diversity can change everything. We can give them the hands-on opportunities that I was talking about earlier. That we can make sure, and we're going to release new statistics about this tomorrow at, at the Next Generation High School Summit, what advanced STEM can mean and how many counties across the country, hundreds of thousands of students don't even have access to advanced courses that we take for granted in many of the best schools and districts in America. And we've got an initiative right now called 100K in 10, which is 100,000 excellent STEM teachers. We're trying to be ahead of schedule on that to, so that we can continue to move the president's goals forward of getting STEM teachers of really high quality in every school and every classroom in America. And so the question for all of us in this room really is, are we ready to do what the president did is, was write a line of code to uh, reduce the, the sense of bias, to use active hands-on learning, and to move forward? Because as the president says, we are the ones we've been waiting for. So for TC, for all of us that have been doing this work in, in urban education for, for years and decades, for the lessons we've learned from Korea and beyond, we have so much work to do, and we cannot rest. This, urgent, this message is urgent, and it is now, and we have 61 weeks in our time in the White House, and we need all of your help to continue continue that support after we're gone so that the, the work of STEM for All and rigorous advanced STEM can happen for everyone. Uh, so with that, I'm excited to take some questions through the poll everywhere and to sort of hear about what is the, uh, the, the things that are most on your mind at TC around tech and, uh, and education. Thank you. Good. I want them tough. What role can or should higher education play in addressing achievement gaps in STEM at the K-12 level? Uh, great question. So uh, the president has a, a, a uh, committee called PCAST, the President's Committee on um, Science and Technology. Uh, and they are um, charged with writing reports and research. And one of the things they found is that we have a, uh, if we reduced the number of uh, dropouts from STEM majors in higher education by just 10%, uh, we would see a million more STEM graduates over the next decade. So what that means basically is that people who walk into college, higher education, and say, I want to do a STEM field, 60% uh, of them don't make it to graduate with a STEM degree. If we reduce that number just to 50%, so we were still batting you know, one for two, which actually in baseball is good, but uh, in general, uh, we only had half of the people graduating with a STEM degree who said they were going to graduate with it, we would have a million more STEM graduates. So that includes both practitioners and teachers and mentors and includes the diverse workforce that we need. And so higher education has a huge role to play in this by thinking differently about STEM education. Many of us, myself included, went to college. We got to freshman year. We heard about like Orgo or the classes that like weed you out. Right? Why is that a paradigm that we allow? Like, why is it reasonable that a college or university says this is the course that determines whether you can do this or not, instead of saying this is the course that's going to teach you to do this? And the course mindset of a weed out course is something that we have to get rid of. We have to figure out how to get more hands on learning and do things like research seminars for freshmen. 
right? Most freshmen in America take courses in these massive lecture halls, even at the, the elite institutions and in, and in uh, some of our community colleges, they get sort of lectures and um, even in small groups. And so we have to figure out how to make the active learning part of the daily experience in higher ed across the board. Um, I think teacher, uh, schools of education have a totally different and unique role to play in that, but I will uh, pause there and see if there are other questions specifically on the, the teacher ed, higher ed piece of the puzzle. So higher ed is extremely um, essential for this to both train the workforce and to get the uh, uh, diverse group of STEM professionals so that everybody can look around and say STEM is for me and not just for some people. <laughs> Second question. What have you learned about high quality professional development for STEM? So I would argue that high quality professional development for STEM is no different than high quality professional development period. So in my practice in my practitioner work, um, I relied a lot on a, a guy named Doug Lamov. And if you haven't read Teach Like a Champion, is my single best teacher practice recommendation. And so I recommend it highly. There's now Te Teach Like a Champion 2.0. Uh, and what Doug was able to do for me when we first uh, became friends in 2004 was create a system, uh, a taxonomy, a language to talk to one another about the practice and craft of teaching. And so it's the same in STEM, which is you have to have a practice and a language to be able to talk about what you're doing and how to make it work. So we need an active pedagogy taxonomy. We need to be able to talk about what it looks like and not just in anecdotes and not just in sort of like, I saw this great lesson and this person did this, but actually much more methodically broken down into their component parts. And so Doug's metaphor here is that he, he looks at teacher videos like he looks at, you know, football teams look at game tape and they analyze the game tape for every play that the teacher moves. And did they go right or did they go left? And what did they do when you know, it was uh, you know, fourth and nine and it was the fourth quarter versus, you know, how did the, the, the idea of using teacher game tape to develop teachers so that they were looking at their own tape, that their teachers were looking at them, that is a tool that is used in far too few American schools right now. It's incredibly cheap. It's not a, a cost function. It's a question of how we can give teachers uh, and principals the sort of tools they need to be better at professional development. So the first thing I'd say is it's not that different from professional development overall. But I will say the thing that is harder about it is because we have this pyramid problem and why we need these million new STEM grads and why undergraduate has to do so much more is that there aren't enough good STEM teachers to teach the next generation of STEM students. And so we have to not just have a linear solution, we have to have figure out an exponential solution. So the, the Department of Education just launched a new initiative, an X site. I was just telling your uh, TC team here about it. And uh, this experimental site will allow universities, existing higher education institutions, to partner with non-traditional educational institutions like General Assembly or Flatiron School or Code.org or any organization that might not be a traditional college and partner with them to deliver some of these tools, especially in things like computer science, where if you want to find a computer science teacher who's going to teach AP computer science in a high school, but they can make $100,000, $150,000 tomorrow in the private sector, that's a very tough market to fill. So what we've got to figure out how to do is to train existing teachers with those skills so that they can have computer science be part of the repertoire that they teach and build it into the work that they do. So STEM is a bit of a, more, a greater challenge on professional development, uh, but we're hoping to open up some new avenues for universities to explore and be more experimental than they might have been in the past. Uh, so that's a great question. First thing I'll say is that uh, the federal government doesn't do anything in the compulsory course category. So it's an important reminder about our, our uh, federalist system, public dollars uh, in uh, K-12 education writ large are almost a trillion dollars a year. The federal government's role in that is less than 8%. So in terms of funding, we play a very small part. And in fact, there's a number of pieces of legislation on the books that basically say the federal government can't, not just um, shouldn't, but can't make curricular decisions for states. So those are state decisions. So you need to work with your states and your, your uh, local superintendents and local school boards to change curricular policies. And it's one of the reasons we've been pushing very hard um, through Bully Pulpit to encourage governors to change laws around computer science, for example, or robotics, for example, to become courses that actually count for credit. Believe it or not, more than half the states in the country don't count computer science for credit towards graduation. Uh, this is insane today, but that's where most uh, uh, states are because the policy world has not caught up with the speed of the technology sector. And so the policy world has a lot of catching up to do. And so I think that is um, w one of the big things. Now, on robotics specifically, um, my boss is like a total, uh, she went to MIT and she's a total robotics geek. She's a mechanical engineer who absolutely loves this. And so my second day on the job at the White House, she said, 
uh, we're booking you a ticket tomorrow. We're going to first national robotics championships. And I had never done robotics myself. I went to Bronx Science and so like I'd seen them, but I hadn't actually like done them myself. And she's like, you've got to see this to understand what it is. And she was deeply passionate in making sure that robotics was something that is offered at every school in America. Um, so what you have to do is create incentives and use the bully pulpit opportunities like this to encourage people to bring robotics into the work that they do. And so we've started to do that at my former schools and try to basically preach the work of robotics as a hands-on active learning tool to do exactly what I was just describing, which is now you've got these amazing kids actually doing the robotics, not just talking about it, not just learning about it from a lecture, but actually hands-on building it. And it goes all the way down to kindergarten. They have a junior first robotics Lego league that allows kindergartners to start to build kindergarten robots. And it's an amazing opportunity to see the five-year-olds at the national championships like competing with their robots and the seniors who have like these incredible machines that are sort of NASA grade robots doing these incredible tasks. So I personally love robots. It's not about compulsory, it's about uh, encouraging and trying to get states to incorporate it into the work that they're doing. So it, it, this, this format is different though because it feels like I'm only hearing my voice and your voice, which is unfortunate. So I kind of wish that you were just asking questions directly, but uh, we'll, we'll keep going with the tech for a little while longer. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we did. Uh, so is it getting the necessary attention it deserves? I think certainly from the, the president and our team, the answer is yes. It's, it's like central to our uh, awareness. It goes back to the tools that you have in your arsenal and what you can actually do from the federal level. Most of those decisions are at the city and state level. And so let me just give you a little bit of math. And this might be one of those things that I hope sticks with you from this talk, uh, which is I know like a million miles a minute in the, in the evening here. Um, in America, we spend right now about $12,000 per pupil on average. New York City, where we're sitting, we spend almost $22,000 per pupil on average. So if we round down and we go to the average in America and say we're going to round down to $10,000 per pupil on average. So now we're only talking about less money than most of the country spends on education. That means for every classroom of 25 students, which is the average class size right now, we have a quarter million dollars in operating expenses every year. So instead of thinking about budgeting from the top down or the federal government should provide more money or more resources or the New York City Department should provide more money or more resources, let's think about budgeting and building schools from the bottom up. So that means if I have a classroom with 25 children and $250,000 to budget for that class, what do I start to spend the money on? Well, for me in building schools, it was the teacher. So we started salaries at 65 and our best teachers are making 100 and we sort of moved the needle on teacher salary. And then we said, what's really important for that classroom if we want to make it successful? Well, this another teacher. So we often put a second teacher in that classroom, whether it was a special ed teacher or an additional support uh, teacher. Then we need to provide teacher coaching and support and mentorship. So at each grade level for four classes, we had an administrator who supported those teachers. And the big picture is when you budget from the bottom up, it doesn't seem that under-resourced. It actually seems kind of crazy that we spend a quarter million dollars a year on 25 kids to educate them for one year. And yet, we are getting these results that are, as you see, lower in the world than they should be and dropping. When Korea, as we talked about earlier, was spending almost a third on absolute dollars and even less in uh, uh, proportionally GDP uh, than we were and getting dramatically better results. So I just want to challenge all of us to think about this not as a resource problem, but as a priorities problem. Because the resources are there, but the existing system and the people that benefit from the existing system have incredible interests to maintain in keeping that system without change. And the exciting thing for technology for me is that it has the possibility to upend that and to really disrupt it in a way that hasn't been disrupted in the education reform work of the past 20 years. We haven't seen the disruption I would have liked to see. And I think technology is the potential tool to help create some more of that disruption and really free up some of those dollars to be better used for the under-resourced uh, classrooms. But I will say again, Newark, New Jersey, $20,000. Camden, New Jersey, $21,000. New York City, $22,000 per pupil per year. And the math I just gave you was for $10,000 per year. So those are cities that are spending double, they're spending half a million dollars per classroom to educate a group of kids for a, half a, year, for a year. And there's something wrong with the way that we're spending the money if you're actually seeing that much dollars go in and such uh, poor quality come out on the other end. One last question. Uh, is the administration looking at speed along with STEM? Right. So, so 
you know, I, I don't want to, uh, to I, I'm in my official capacity, so I don't want to make, you know, make policy, but I will say we all have things that we are passionate about, and we can add a letter to any acronym and, like, make a new acronym, right? Uh, the, the idea here, I'm passionate about civics and citizenship, right? So should it be CSTEM or, say, you know, system? Like, we can figure this out if we want to just keep adding letters, but I believe deeply that what you see when you work on a robotics team is that the arts are integrally involved for it, right? Design and design thinking are integrally, in, integrally involved in building a robot or getting a robotics competition off the ground. And so I think when you do STEM right, all of the other pieces are part of that equation. So it's really less about the acronym than it is about the practice that our teachers have in their classrooms. And so I'm less worried about the STEAM STEM debate than I am about making sure that classrooms do really great robotics or really great computer science because I think those are the things that if you're doing a, um, a computer science, you know, even, even in elementary school, if you're using Scratch, right? It's a visual programming language. It's as artistic as you can get. You're building things and building tools. So I think that's STEAM even more than it is STEM in some ways. And yet we shouldn't have to worry about these debates. I don't think just the acronym means we're forgetting about things. Um, I think that it is a way to say science and technology and engineering and math and all of the things that are, that are designing the future. If we want to have our kids be creators and not just consumers of that technology, we have to give them those skills and there are hard skills in, in um, uh, STEM that we're working to, to see. So uh, as a long way of saying like we're committed to STEM but it's not for you know, exclusion of anything else. So uh, I'll just say, uh, I, we, we thought we had a hard stop at 7 and 7.01, so we did pretty well packing in as much dense content as humanly possible in that period of time. Uh, but if people have individual questions, I'm happy to stick around for a while and talk with you a little bit more about the work that we're doing. That's lovely. Well, I think you've got twice as much because you talk, speak as, twice as fast as <laughs> <laughs> I do want to thank uh, Lisa Miller, who's Professor of Psychology and Education here for inviting us. <coughs> to Teachers College, and thank you again, Seth, for sharing your perspective on STEM education. And thank all of you for attending. I think this is a very important topic that we're just really beginning to understand and explore. Come back soon. Thanks so much.